I went down to Brazil and I was asked to speak to a leadership meeting. And I remember flying down to a city called Goiânia, Brazil. And they said, we want you to just speak to our pastors and leaders. It will be pastors and leaders only. So they drive me to the arena and I walk in and there's 12,500 pastors and leaders in their church network. And this whole arena is packed and they are like rocking the house with praise and worship. I mean, the roof is going boom, boom, boom from the way they are dancing and singing and going after Jesus. So um, the next day I'm at lunch with like eight of the top leaders of the whole church network. And I'm talking to these guys at lunch. And I said, okay, how many people do you have in your churches? All your churches. First of all, they told me how many hundreds of churches they had. I said, well, how many people are in your churches? And they said, well, we have over 300,000 people in our churches. I thought, wow, that's significant. I said, well, when did this all begin? They said, well, it all began with one family in 1999. Yeah, that's what I said. And I sat there and I said, what? Do you mean to tell me that 16 years ago, one family started this network and now you have over 300,000 people? They said, yeah. I said, okay, please enlighten me. How do you build a church of over 300,000 people in 16 years in a first world nation? Now, I thought I knew their response. I thought the answer to this question, they're going to say it's because of our home groups, our home fellowship groups. And without even batting an eye, without even hesitating, the leader who spoke the best English looked at me and he said, it's because we teach our people on eternal rewards and judgment. I've noticed Americans don't talk about the judgment seat of Christ. And he said, so American Christians, they have a 70 or 80 year perspective. He said, our believers, we have an eternal perspective. And when you have an eternal perspective, you live differently. You make decisions differently. You endure things that you wouldn't necessarily endure if you have a 70 or 80 year perspective. You pursue things differently. If you read the apostles who wrote the New Testament, you will find the older they became, if you look at their lives chronologically in the books they wrote, the more they wrote about the next world. John the Apostle, when he was in his 90s, one of the last books he wrote, he says in this one verse, and this is where this entire book came from, it's for you. <laughs> All right. He says that we do not lose those things we work for, but, everybody say but, that we may receive a full reward. Is that John just doesn't say reward. Notice he says full reward listen to my voice because God wants you to receive the full reward. You can't do one thing to make God love you any more than he loves you. You cannot do one thing to make God love you any less than he loves you. But we are in charge of how pleased he is with us. That's why Paul said we make it our goal not just to be pleasing but to be well-pleasing. Why? Why do we make that goal? Why does Paul tell us to make that goal? Because of the next verse. For or because, he's continuing the thought, we, we here is only Christians, must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or what? Come on now, or what? bad? Every one of us as believers are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. At that judgment seat, we will not be examined for our sins. Why? Because our sins have been eradicated by the blood of Jesus. Everybody say, thank God for that. Amen. We'll stand before Jesus and we'll give an account of how we live this life as Christians. The Bible is very clear that he will not only examine our works as Christians, but he will examine our words as well as our thoughts, motives, and intentions. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5 says this. Look at this. It says, so don't make judgments about anyone ahead of the time before the Lord returns, for he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives, then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. Let me tell you, when a sinner stands at the white throne judgment, there will be no praise given. Paul is not talking about sinners here. 
He's talking about believers. Now, whenever you say the word judgment in today's world, we immediately go to the word condemnation. However, 90% of the time that you see the word judgment appear in the New Testament is from the Greek word krima. Do you know what that Greek word means? Listen to me. It's a decision resulting from an investigation. That's simply what judgment means, a decision. So Jesus is going to examine our lives as Christians. He's going to examine our works, our words, our thoughts, our motives, our intentions. As a result of that thorough examination, he's going to make decisions over our life. Because remember, judgment means decision. And as a result of those decisions, we're either going to receive rewards or we're going to suffer losses. What we do with the cross determines where we're going to spend eternity. Most Christians know that, heaven or hell. However, the way we live as believers determines how we're going to spend eternity. What we do in this zero time determines how we're going to spend eternity. Every moment of your life, you have a choice. So you have to understand, God gives us choices. You can build however you want. Okay, let me give you an example. Like if I want to spend my time convincing you the Detroit Lions are the team of the NFL, I promise you that is wood, hay, and straw, and that will be burned up. Do you know you have a chance? You can spend all your time on social media building with wood, hay, and straw. Or you can use social media to build with gold, silver, and precious stones. The choice is yours. I, I, I could be a member of this worship team, this amazing worship team that was up here tonight. And one person could be up here and they're building with straw. Want to know why? Because they up here want everybody to see them. And this person's building with gold because why? They're just ministering to the Lord. See, every motive will be examined. Next verse, verse 13. But on judgment day, fire, everybody say fire, fire. will reveal what kind of work each builder has done. The fire will show if a person's work has any value. So when you put the fire under the Detroit Lions, gone. You understand what I'm talking about? When you put the fire under the person who's worshiping Jesus and leading people into, when you put fire under gold, silver, precious jewels, it purifies them. What's the standard? What's the fire that's going to judge us on judgment day? His word. Jeremiah said his word's like a fire. Okay, so look at the next verse, verse 14. If the work survives, that builder, everybody say builder, builder. will receive a reward. Hopefully a full reward. But if the work is burned up, the builder will suffer great loss. The builder will be saved. In other words, they're going to heaven. But like someone barely escaping through walls of flames, we prepare for retirement, right? And how many of you know that's smart, right? It is smart to build for retirement, right? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. So... Can you imagine the day you retire? The day you retire. Your bank closes its doors. It's done. It's gone under. You lose all your money, all your checking, all your savings. The same day you retire, Social Security goes bankrupt. They have no more money in the treasury to give anybody. The same day you retire, your house catches on fire. You barely escape with just your pajamas on and watch everything burned up. And the same day, your insurance company goes bankrupt. Now, what do you call that? A bad day. Not 30 years of retirement, eternity. I hope this is doing in you what it did in me. It literally rocked my life, changed my life forever.